This is a very exciting um, day for us because this is the beginning of the Dean Seminar. Uh, Professor Rhonda Griffiths isn't here today. She sends her apology to the presenters uh, for her personal reasons. So um, I have the privilege today to actually introduce four of my colleagues and I, I think it's important that I introduce every one of them. We've got Dr. Jess George, Professor Marie Johnson, Professor Helen, Hannah Dullum, and Dr. Margaret Duff. And um, this is a, an NHMRC project, and the, the title of the project today is Midwifery Initiated Oral Health. So I get on to the first speaker. Thank you, Esther, for that um, uh, introduction. Um, so yes, we're, we're basically going to be talking about this uh, research program that we've been developing since 2009. Um, it started as a very small project um, as, a, as part of my postdoctorate. Um, as many of you may know, you know, after your high of a PhD, you're kind of in no man's land after that. Um, what do you do next? Um, and uh, I guess that's where Marie, being the great mentor she is, um, kind of said, well, think of something that kind of blends in stuff that you've done in the past. Um, and um, start as, as I said, very small, um, and it's kind of grown quite big um, over the last few years. Um, it's been an interesting journey. We've had lots of uh, stakeholders, as you can see from the logos there. We've had ups and downs, um, and I guess, what we'd like to convey to you guys today is the journey we've, we've gone through and, and I guess the, the decisions we took, the strategic decisions that kind of shaped the path at which the um, project has gone down. Um, rather than uh, touch on the main findings, I don't want to you know, bore you on that aspect, but kind of how each phase complemented each other um, and, and, and overall the, the direction that we've been taking. Um, and I've got, um, you know, Part of my team here, a wonderful team, um, uh, Marie, Hannah, and Margaret, um, as, as a, who's come on board uh, as a consultant initially and has been helping with different aspects. So we're going to be dividing the presentation up between us four. And I'd first like to um, hand over to uh, Marie, who would, uh, I guess, kick off the presentation. We thought it was important to talk about um, why this particular topic was chosen. Um, people may or may not be aware that CANA is a jointly funded uh, centre, which means that we have an obligation to look at both nursing and midwifery practice. And um, Ajesh, for all his sins, when he came on board as a postdoc, I said I needed him to look at uh, midwifery practice because we need to look at um, something innovative there that we could put forward. So um, we have two main areas of research that CANA deals with, and that is patient safety and women's and children's health. So in fact, Ajesh has been working in that area in relation to this particular project. One of the things I'd like to say from the outset Although Ajesh has been very meek and mild saying it was a little project from the outset, it never was. It was actually designed with all its phases from the very beginning, which is a very unusual thing. And we spent a long time designing it and it is based on very traditional ways of uh, developing and designing uh, a research uh, project over many years to implement uh, a complex intervention. And for people who are interested in finding out that design, because we're going to talk about a lot today, uh, you can look up the Medical Research Council guidance on designing complex interventions. And they have a particular set of steps in them, and we have followed those to the letter. The second part, which was very important, was to have the right team. And team is everything, and I can't make that, um, I can't strengthen that statement enough to have the right team will be the success in you getting any grant at any level, whether it be a pilot or an NHNMRC. Your team will be everything. And for us, we had to have a very big team. You will find shortly that we needed dentists and we needed dental services to be on board. We needed expert midwives to be on board. So we needed quite a collection of people to, be, to come together and that had taken some time to do. Um, and I'm sure Jess will tell you about that a little bit. Are you? Yes. Okay. 
We also went so far as to include um, the Professor of Population Oral Health for New South Wales Health as well on this team. The topic that was chosen was also one that we knew was a political hot topic. We had deliberately chosen that. Uh, we knew that oral health was on the agenda for maybe being looked at to be funded for um, under Medicare. And of course that came in and went out with the government and may come back again. So that was quite important to us as well. But the first step of course was to do the systematic review to identify whether in fact there was evidence for the intervention we were proposing. So that was the first place we started. The second step is to explore, if you like, whether the idea we had was acceptable to midwives, the professional group, but also to pregnant women. Were women even interested in this idea or were we just going down a path that wasn't very interesting at all? Then of course we proceeded to if you like, somewhat of the feasibility and efficacy trial, which is the pilot study, and then we proceeded to the multi-centre trial, which is currently being funded by the NHNMRC. And we have one more step to go, and actually two more steps to go, which is about uh, process evaluation. And finally, there is a step which is uh, about long-term evaluation in a very uncontrolled manner over many years. So. At the moment, I'm going to stop there and hand it over to Ajesh. The topic, well, we, you know, we looked at the evidence about on oral health and pregnancy and we started finding out that basically due to various issues like hormonal variations, dietary changes and morning sickness, pregnant women are very prone to dental problems. And at around the time that we were exploring this topic, there was a lot of research coming out on the association between poor oral health and adverse pregnancy outcomes, so preterm birth and low birth weight. Um, so the, a lot of trials, the evidence were coming out around 2009, 2010, systematic reviews were coming out. Um, and, and we also knew that in addition to pregnancy outcomes and that early childhood decay is as, frequent, as prevalent as asthma, not really reported that much and one of the main reasons for the high incidence is the direct transmission of bacteria from the mother to the child after the baby's born and so research was clearly showing that if they had poor oral health during pregnancy and it continued after birth there was significant uh, high risk of them having early childhood caries um, and and that can have implications on you know their speech their diet everything um, so clearly there was there was a lot of um, research showing the importance of, of this topic. Um, but we also knew, found out that, well, pregnant women seldom see dentists during pregnancy. Um, and the literature highlights lack of awareness, cost, misconceptions. And in Australia, less than a third of women actually see a dentist, even if they have a problem. Around 2010-11, um, guidelines came out in, in America on the important role of antenatal care providers, midwives, doctors, gynecologists, in playing an important role in oral health. Um, as many of you would know, you, you generally only see a dentist when you have a problem. And uh, from a dental point of view, that's too late. So um, there, was a, there was a need to involve health professionals um, who were interacting with these women at an earlier stage. And hence the reason why antenatal care providers are the, are the best choice. So the guidelines basically said, well, we need them to raise awareness about the importance of oral health and kind of maybe screen them and refer them to the correct pros, uh, referral pathway. And we had few models that were out there um, in the US, uh, quite a few antenatal um, services have incorporated oral health as part of their program. In the UK, I'm not sure if anyone's been trained in the UK or from the UK, um, as part of the National Health Service, they provide free dental care to pregnant women during pregnancy and for 12 months after giving birth. So they clearly had a lot of um, importance in this area uh, from their side. When we looked at Australia, well, basically we found that there was definitely a lack of emphasis um, on maternal oral health. Most of the initiatives were on early childhood. Um, and the actual role, potential role of midwives in this area was clearly not defined. Um, the guidelines didn't really have anything on oral health, uh, even in the practice, no one really spoke about oral health unless it was raised by the, by the pregnant women. 
only recently, I think uh, six months back, did the Department of Health bring out guidelines for the first um, uh, trimester on uh, raising awareness about oral health. So that's 2013. Um, so there was definitely uh, no system in place to kind of raise awareness and guide them to a, a certain referral process. Um, so what we initially started, our main aim was to well develop a program where midwives would incorporate this into their practice, raise awareness about oral health, um, and basically they would provide oral health education. Not sure if you can see those photos. So oral health education, do a screening check, and refer them to a dental service. Um, we looked at the guidelines there, and um, we, we, there were a few screening tools there that would assist us in this, but we wanted to also potentially incorporate as a visual check as well into the screening process and, and I'll speak about that when we talk about the consultation process. So like Marie said, but before we, so that was our idea, but we firstly had to form a, a team um, and um, like Marie said, we had to choose a large team, a multidisciplinary team. Um, and um, Marie was there who's got experience in, con in, in conducting large studies, um, you know, epi epi epidemiological studies. Dr. Ajwani and Dr. Bole are um, the head, um, well, Dr. Bole is the head of oral health research and, and the services at Sydney and Southwestern Sydney and Sydney Dental Hospital. Uh, and Shupi is the head of research and promotion. So we, we clearly had to have the dental uh, component in the study, in the dental team. And so we, we initially approached them with this idea. And around the same time when we approached them, the New South Wales Health were also acknowledging the importance of non-dental professionals in early childhood. So they started using child and family health nurses in promoting oral health in children. And it's in the blue book, um, the, the child checks that they do. So they felt that this was a, a good project to complement what they were doing in the, during pregnancy. Um, and we knew we, we had to get experts in midwifery. So Hannah uh, came along and, and um, we had to use Mar uh, Margie as well for developing the education program. But in addition, we had to get someone who knew the policy uh, and, and the issues around how this could translate in, into, pra into practice. So we approached uh, Professor Blinkon, who's from the UK, has a lot of experience in this area. Um, and we also had a stats person, um, Dr. Anthony Yu. We also knew that in order to do this, we had to identify a suitable site um, and, and get uh, a midwife on, uh, well, who's in, doing service in the hospital on board. And we thought of Campbelltown Hospital because most of the disadvantaged families in the area are in Campbelltown. So we approached Sharon and the managers there and proposed this as well. And um, well, it was to my surprise that they actually acknowledged that this was a problem. Many of them were facing seeing women without teeth um, in the antenatal ward. Um, and, and so they actually, um, on their own initiative, were we're actually raising this as part of antenatal care. So it kind of worked out well that, you know, um, everyone seemed to acknowledge that there was, a, there was a need for further research in this area. So with this team, we then basically decided to go forth. And as like Marie said, we decided to look at the evidence um, and the rationale for this proposal, um, look at the perceptions, um, kind of do a feasibility study with the, both the midwives and the pregnant women because this was something quite radical. Um, you know, midwives never even spoke about oral health and from the pregnant women's point of view, it was never really uh, uh, talked about during antenatal care. And, and I guess phase three, I'll, I'll speak about that a bit later, but that kind of the phase two fa kind of shaped the, the, fa the way we did phase three where we had to design an education program train them up, pilot the program, and currently we're in the uh, multi-center trial. So first thing was look at the, looking at the evidence, um, and you know, we clearly found out that there was a lack of emphasis on oral health, especially in the Australian context. And, um, and you know, as Marie always says, you've got to keep on publishing whatever you do, keep on publishing, building up, building your, um, build on the evidence that's already there. And the first paper, as many of you would know, with systematic reviews takes a long time to publish. Um, and it took about a year, I think. We got a lot of rejections. Um, they basically didn't like the idea. It was maybe a bit too radical. Um, especially the local journals in Australia found it a bit too radical. Um, so we went overseas to the clinical nursing. Um, well, basically that paper basically put forward the idea that midwives can have an important role 
in this on this topic. We also did a meta-analysis um, on all the randomized trials till 2010, I think it was published, and we found that from the evidence that was available then, um, providing dental treatment in particular, um, improving their gum condition, could have a positive impact on uh, birth weight and, um, well, reduce adverse pregnancy outcomes. Um, that's, there's a lot of systematic reviews that have come after that that have um, basically said the opposite. Um, the most recent one actually says that it does have a positive influence on high-risk women. So, um, you know, so it keeps on changing as more trials come in. The next phase was looking at basically uh, the perceptions. So we had to uh, do a feasibility study. So we went to Campbelltown Hospital, got some research assistants and dental assistants, did focus groups with 15 midwives, did interviews with 10 pregnant women, and we did a survey of 241 women at Campbelltown Hospital. Basically, we wanted to gather evidence of whether, what was the oral health status of these women? What do they know about this? Did they like the idea of midwives actually talking about this? Because um, there was really nothing out there published, especially um, in, in, in this area. So I'm just going to quickly go through, but basically we weren't surprised there was a high prevalence of poor oral health. More than 50% of the women surveyed had serious problems. Um, and and, and like, you, like I said, some of the midwives said, well, some of them don't have any teeth. There's a second quote there. Um, so there was clearly a high prevalence of poor health, around, I'd say, about 50 to 60 percent, and that's consistent with the literature. There was a lack of dental care. Very few women were seeing a dentist. Uh, more than half of the women um, who had dental problems actually didn't see a dentist. And um, I think more than half also had seen a dentist, not seen a dentist in the last 12 months. Very few had actually spoken about oral health with their midwives. Very few. When we explored the barriers, no surprise, there was a lack of awareness. Many uh, women didn't really know the potential link with pregnancy outcomes and even early childhood decay. Um, and what was very surprising was only 10% of the women surveyed actually received any sort of information about the importance of oral health during pregnancy. The high cost of treatment, which is again no surprise because it's not part of Medicare, that was a big barrier for them. Um, and we also had misconceptions, and that's also as part of literature. Many of them felt you can't see a dentist. Um, there's that old tale of um, uh, you lose a tooth for every child. Um, so there's a lot of misconceptions there. Oh, it's, uh, if I go see a, sorry, yes. Um, and if you see a dentist, if if you see a dentist, potentially it can impact the baby. You know, a lot of misconceptions there. And when we did further analysis, we found that, well, you know, women that actually had received information about oral health were 3.25 times more likely to see a dentist than those that didn't. And if they had private health insurance, they were 2.47 times more likely. Um, so it kind of, the barriers revolved around raising awareness and getting priority access to, to, to dental care. When we looked at the perceptions of midwives promoting oral health, um, the women basically weren't really, um, uh, weren't, they weren't really concerned about this new thing. They already had a very good relationship with midwives, a very personal relationship. So, you know, many of them were very comfortable with the idea. When we explored specific questions like if midwives were to ask you questions, um, refer you to a dental service, and even maybe doing a visual check. Um, I'm not sure if you can see the figures, but more than 90% were happy with that. So, um, you know, there was, they were clearly comfortable with the, the idea. Um, when we explored midwives' perceptions, well, they, I guess they acknowledged that it was important. They were, you, you know, you're basically confirming the concerns that they were seeing in the clinic. But they really raised three issues that had to be tackled before they, they even, even thought about this. Um, and the first one was time constraints. Um, so we were focusing this program at the first booking visit, and they do a lot of stuff in the first booking, a lot of assessments. So time constraints was the main thing. Educational requirements. They really never, were never taught anything in undergraduate level. The guidelines didn't have anything about oral health. So many of them were very, I guess, hesitant to bring up this topic because they didn't want to provide wrong information. And the last one was referral pathways. There had to be clear referral pathways if we were going to ask midwives to raise this awareness, well, the women had to have access to dental service, otherwise there's no point. So these three issues were clearly something that we had to tackle. 
Um, and, and, and so we, like I said, we kept on publishing these things and so we published all these findings just to build up evidence on, on top of the literature, a systematic review and meta-analysis in both uh, nursing, midwifery and dental journals. So from our initial consultation and feasibility study, we, were, we came, out, came out of it by uh, a bit happy saying, well, we, we, we found out that there was a clear need for a program in this area, but we definitely had to tailor it to the needs of midwives and pregnant women. Um, and I guess um, I didn't mention here, but from the pregnant women's perspective, we got insight as to the location of the dental services, when it should be offered, you know, in terms of feasibility, if we were to provide that. So all that helped in shaping the program. From this point on, we felt, we felt well, we first need to kind of address the educational issues uh, of the requirements for midwives. And so that's when we approached Hannah and Margie on, on how to we develop this and involve the Australian College of Midwives. So I'm going to hand over to Margie, who's going to talk about the program. Yes. Right. Well, I was challenged to um, develop a resource that um, could educate midwives out there in the clinical arena and I guess the most important thing that it had to be was complete. All the midwives wanted something that had, they didn't want to go off and search for stuff. So we needed to have everything there. We decided as um, an expert group that we would do an online education program. But before we could do that, we actually developed it up as a hard copy package with everything in. So before we could actually develop a workbook for the package, we um, developed a competency. Being a good educationalist, you have to have a competency along with all the aims and objectives to go with it. So hence I've got this because I can never remember it. So the competency turned out to be this after much um, discussion. The midwife has the knowledge and skills to undertake an oral health cavity screenings on pregnant women, refer if appropriate and provide the woman with the relevant evidence-based information to promote good oral material, maternal and infant health. Should have had my glasses on. <laughs> so um, to go with that, we decided that the workbook should have three modules. The first module was all about the, the background material, what the evidence was. The second part of the second module was about the anatomy and physiology of the um, mouth and things that occurred during the pregnancy that may impact on women's health orally. Um, and the, thir the um, third module was all about developing the skill around assessing women and um, practicing, I guess, what to do. So um, in the workbooks, each of the modules had aims and objectives. We wanted to make it as interactive and interesting as possible. So each of the modules contained all the reference material that was required, but also um, the ability of the participants to actually go out and seek other material. They had um, video clips to watch through YouTubes. They had um, little periods of reflection and scenarios to reflect upon. And at the end of each module, we had um, test your knowledge for that particular section. So all in all, three modules for the package. It contained all the learning materials and everything that they needed, which eventually would go online. The script um, covered everything that we actually covered in module three. And we used some of the photos from the video in a step-by-step -step guide throughout so that the student the midwife in this case, um, could actually practice each step of the process. Um, the final area is competency testing. So once the, the midwives had completed all of the, the course, the three modules, used the um, test your skills in each section 
and felt competent to um, sit the test, they could. And we had th two examinations. One was a theoretical examination where they just did multi-choice questions in a set period of time. And at the end of that time, time was up and they pushed the button and it gave them an automatic result. If they passed, and the pass rate's 80%, um, they could print off a certificate of successful, successful completion. Once they had completed that, they could then go on and sit a clinical assessment. And that was also watching the video and doing some multiple choice questions around the skill. Same thing, set period of time. They had to pass everything in this particular session. I think there were 10 MCQs, is that 15? 15. 15 multiple choice questions. They had to get them all right. And if they did, they passed the competency part. Once again, push the button. They knew straight away if they passed or they didn't. If they passed, they could print off a certificate of achievement. Um, now, although this package was developed for research, it is actually a win-win because the midwives themselves got CPD points for and 16 from the College of Midwives. So that was a great win-win activity. So I don't know if you can actually see this, because I certainly can't, but this is an overview of the oral health program itself. So what this actually tells you is that it's an online registration for the course. Um, all the education program is there, module one, two and three. Then once the midwives have completed that section, which is right at the top, and I can't point to it, um, they can sit their examinations. If they fail either one, they can actually resit. Um, and I think it is three times, it's three times? Twice. No one, no one's failed. <laughs> which is a very good thing. Um, and so they've completed both assessments, they get their certificates and then it's forwarded and they get us, um, 16 points accredited from the college. And once again, as Ajish said, everything is published. And so there is an article here published on that part of the online education. So now I'm going to hand over to Hannah. Yeah. So why should midwives be involved in oral health care? It may seem a very funny uh, uh, mix, um, but in fact it's actually a really, really natural mix. And I, I just want to make the point that, you know, we, we really struggle within our profession for collaboration to be a reality and to work well. And this has been a great example of different professional groups being able to work together when they put aside their, uh, their turf wars and they focus on the, the well-being of the the client who is their, the centre of their care. So I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about why midwives are being involved in this domain that is really a, about uh, dentists. So you all would be aware of the Nursing uh, uh, and Midwifery Board of Australia and that we have got um, midwifery um, competencies and standards that we need to meet as professionals. And Competency 9 in particular gives midwives responsibility for acting to address public health issues and for collaborating and referring to other healthcare providers as needed. So it fits very, very nicely with midwifery, which is increasingly now being promoted as a primary healthcare discipline, which is increasingly being asked to take up this, this um, mandate to promote health and well-being, and which is increasingly being asked to collaborate um, with multidisciplinary, um, d with different professions. And the international definition of a midwife, which was um, revised in 2011, states that midwives clearly have a role in preventative care, um, in health counselling and educating of women and their families and the community. So once again, fits in very nicely with the underpinning central concepts uh, that, that midwifery is all about. The other thing that's really uh, important is midwives are 
generally quite approachable. There are the odd uh, battle axes out there, but generally they're quite approachable. They're also the people who see midwives the most in this country and for the longest periods of time. Uh, women who see private obstetricians, for example, may be lucky to get five or ten minutes. Um, and midwifery care, we're increasing that to being a more and more visits and now being at least half an hour. But midwives also are the very first providers, other than the GP who does the um, the pregnancy test and the initial blood screens and then refers on. Midwives are the very first professionals that a pregnant woman will engage with who has expertise around pregnancy. And they will do the booking visit and this is where this um, check is now getting embedded. Uh, so they are they are often women um, in a lot of the literature rate midwives as very approachable. Mid women are much more likely to tell midwives about issues than, than doctors and midwives have more time for them than any other health professional. So it's ideally positioned both philosophically, both as far as, as professional standards and also around acceptability to women. Okay, so we basically reached the stage where we had the backing of ACM. We had all these products ready, um, this education program. That was all good, but we had to test it. Um, and so we initially had to pilot test the education program. Um, and we did that at Campbelltown Hospital, pre and post. Um, we did see improvement in knowledge. It wasn't significant. And the um, reason behind that, we felt, was because there was a lot of awareness building beforehand. So the initial knowledge was quite high. But from the qualitative findings, there was clearly a lot more confidence among midwives um, about uh, the importance of uh, raising this. And they had some sort of guide as to how do we go about doing this. If some questions were raised, they could answer them basically from the workbook. But, um, and that's just some of the midwives at Campbellton Hospital. Um, Sharon is the second one, the red, uh, with the red. Um, she's the numb there. The mum, sorry. Um, <laughs> not the numb. Sorry. <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> um, and, and, and we've got a system in place at Campbelltown. So as soon as new graduates come, we generate a username and password, and then they, they do the program as well. Simultaneously, um, Victoria Health were exploring this area um, earlier last, well, yeah, the start of last year. And they came up with similar conclusions in terms of the lack of awareness building around, uh, among antenatal care providers. And because we were publishing and because we had involved ACM, they heard about us um, and approached us and explored whether we would like to pilot the education program in Victoria, which we did. Um, and uh, from their pre and post, we found significant improvement in the oral health knowledge of the, of the women, I mean, sorry, of, of the midwives, as well as their confidence in providing the service. Um, and, and there's a quote there where, from one of the midwives. And, the actual program was launched by the Minister of Early Childhood in Victoria uh, earlier this year, and there's a few of the midwives that received this certificate, uh, CPD certificate. So when we reached this point, we definitely were co confident about the education program. We was going to basically um, you know, help in capacity building of the midwives. We then had to pilot the actual program, the whole program, not just the midwifery component, the dental component. So we conducted a randomized three-arm control trial um, between uh, June 2011 and May of 2012 at Campbellton Hospital. And this is where the, our dental counterparts played a very important role because in order to do this, we were creating, or I'll just tell you well, the, the, what was happening in the group. So we had the current practice as the control group. We had one group which provided the mid midwifery intervention you saw in the video. But the women in that group were referred to the existing dental services. So if they're eligible, public, private, or their own private, uh, or their um, health, health fund. The last group, we created two free clinics around, in the public service around Campbelltown Hospital at Ingleburn and Rosemeadow. Now, we didn't have funding to provide such a large service. Uh, and, and I must say that getting funding was also an issue for this. You know, we, we started with 4,000 and we just kept on, uh, you know, getting a bit of money here and there from key supporting uh, organizations. So our dental counterparts were, were uh, put their hand up and said, well, we'll provide the free service because we believe in the study and we think we want to see whether it works. So they provided a dental team to provide for one year, um, you know, free treatment for the last arm. So basically the arm, the third arm, they got a check and, and free treatment, about three or four sittings, but all women got a free dental check in their last trimester. And all women were provided the brochure that you saw in the video as part of oral health promotional material. 
and the ethics department helped in shaping the, the trial as well. And we initially didn't have oral health promotion, but they felt we need to be, everyone needs to get something out of it. Our main outcome, so we recruited 300 women. Our main outcome, primary outcome was the uptake of dental services. Then we had other outcomes, oral health knowledge, quality of life, oral health, um, the oral health status of the women. We wanted to check the specificity and sensitivity of the actual screening tool. And the last one was birth outcomes, which we, we knew would, we wouldn't have sufficient numbers to do that, but we included that as well. So quickly, um, we found along with three, three groups that the third group that provided all, got all the goodies, both the midwifery and the dental, they had a more than 50% jump in their uptake of dental services. The oral health status of the women significantly improved in terms of their bleeding gums, their plaque, and, and in terms of their gum condition as well. Um, in terms of the oral health quality of life, the third group had significant improvement in the oral health quality of life with, between groups as well. Um, in terms of the oral health knowledge, so all women, um, all the groups had improvement. Um, They're all significant. There wasn't between groups uh, improvement, but they all had improved. The most improvement was seen in the third group. Um, and we think it may be attributed to the awareness building through the oral health promotional material. We also found that the tool had reasonably high specificity, uh, sorry, sensitivity, but specificity we still need to explore further. So we, we started building up all this evidence and we had this encouraging data and you all know how important pilot data is. So we then exp uh, went through one round of NHMRC, got knocked back um, and uh, we then applied again. And fortunately that year they had uh, maternity services a priority. So we got funding from the NHMRC to do a multi-center trial. So uh, we're currently uh, in the first year of the trial at Fairfield Campbellton Nepean Hospital. Uh, we need 630, we have about 450 so far, okay. Um, and so we've got a team, and this time we got money for the dental intervention, so, so that's been fortunate. Um, I guess I'll just highlight then the research output and the translational research that has come out of the study. So uh, we've been publishing so far so, uh, from every aspect of the study, um, and so we've got 15 publications. We've been presenting all the findings at national international conference to raise raise awareness and kind of look, especially with other states, building partners with other states. Um, and we've started with small funding from, you know, cause the Center for Oral Health Strategy, the New South Wales Health uh, Funding Body, uh, that are instrumental in, in uh, implementing new oral health promotional programs in the state. The Australian Dental Association, they've been quite uh, supportive of the program from inception till the trial. Uh, UWS as well and the NHMRC funding. We've had quite a few media, media coverages uh, through uh, the web and the TV. Um, and we were the recipients of the Quality Awards in 2011 and just recently, uh, two weeks back in 2013. And we were the finalists in the New South Wales Health Awards in 2011 and we'll know today about 2013 <laughs> whether what's happening. Um, in terms of translation research, so this program is currently endorsed now in the Victoria Health Strategic Plan, oral promotion, they've included this in the strategic plan. New South Wales as well, they've, it, it went off last year, but it's now back on the agenda. Um, and um, like Margie said, the, this is the first education program um, of its kind actually in the world but, and in Australia, and it's been endorsed by the ACM as a CPD activity, so it's a good selling point for us. Um, what Margie probably didn't forgot to maybe mention was the fact that uh, she and Hannah were, were instrumental, I guess, in including oral health in the Bachelor of Midwifery curriculum. And this is something that has never happened in Australia, it's a first at UWS. Uh, in addition to doing CPD, we had to go down to the grassroots level and, and this, is, this is great. So I think we're going to evaluate it down the track, um, but uh, yeah, well done. Um, all the brochures, so like I said at the start, there was nothing in 2009-10 about oral health promotion. So all our brochures, we've got one for Aboriginal families, we've got translated ones as well. They've all been endorsed by New South Wales Health and they're freely available on their website and it's been distributed across the state. Future direction, so we've now gone into the phase two at Victoria, so we're rolling it out across other antenatal services in Victoria. Um, the Ministry of Health is keen to know the output of our NHMRC study because uh, they're, they're keen to kind of shape some sort of program um, looking at providing maybe free checkups for pregnant women and we're collecting um, you know, the costings involved in that. 
and from the midwifery point of view they want to include the tool in the obstetrics, is it? Yeah, the obstetrics database as well. Um, so that's there. Um, and I guess from this we've had other offshoot projects. Um, one of them is kind of mimicking this model with child and family health nurses and involving them in the Aboriginal community as well. So we're working with Chetra. And we also know that we, it's not just midwives we need to convince, we need to convince gynecologists, doctors. So we're working with the School of Medicine at UWS at looking at developing guidelines. Um, and we're currently just doing a survey in the state because there's nothing out there on what's happening in this area. And we've had interest from um, South Australia, Tasmania and Western Australia about maybe implementing the program there. Um, I guess I'd like to finish off by um, basically maybe playing a, a clip from the channel. Uh, channel 10 play did a short story on our program. Um, I tried to extract just the relevant parts of it, but I'm going to have to play the whole thing, which is probably about four or five minutes. But they've done interviews with pregnant women that were have gone through our study and just uh, I guess it's encouraging from our point of view that they're actually appreciating the service not just midwives but the women as well.